first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming. And I want to know what had you say yes to coming to this session? Now, I bribed like one person in here, but for everyone else, these are new faces. So, does anyone want to share? The Okay, so, so the title yeah. was interesting. So you like the title, so then you're like, oh, I'm going to come and show up to this. Okay, that works. Does anyone else want to share? Uh, I'm having a lot of problems explaining peer stuff to other not peer members, especially the high school communities, because they try to keep pushing mm -hmm. the timeline, and sometimes they don't even have any time for peers. And once a problem is found, it can go like two to six years, and it is really, really quick. The client paid a lot of money. I need mm -hmm. to settle the things now before. Okay, you are in the perfect place. I'm going to give you some communication tools that you're going to put in your toolbox, and then you're going to go away with those, and it's things that you can apply to those exact situations. Okay, does anyone else want to share? What had you say yes? Why did you come to this session versus the other session? Okay, so you're just like, yeah, I'm just going to just show up because my friend is here. Hey, that works. That works also. So I'm starting off my talk, and I'm going to share about that I got my dream job working as a QA engineer at Spotify in New York City. Now, I'm sure some, you know, you guys are familiar with Spotify's brand, you know, it's all music streaming. You know, I worked on the radio and discovery team and I tested product features that went out to millions of people all over the world. And in New York City, you know, like we take the subway every day to work and I would be on the subway and I see people using the app that I tested and I'm like, wow. That's so cool. And that's what I love about being a Q engineer, testing consumer facing products. Because I'm like, I made a difference there. It went through my hands. And then, you know, working at Spotify, you meet celebrities, they come and perform for you. They like whisk you off to Sweden, just hang out there. And I just love Spotify's approach to everything. You know, everything within an agile context, it's not so much what you do, but how you do it. And it was such a space for innovative thinking and creativity, like things that I never even imagined before in my previous jobs working as a QA engineer. And then I had some disconnects with my manager and I lost my job. It's a good thing I live in New York City <laughs> where there is opportunities around the corner. By the way, I still love Spotify. You know, I'm all about them. Would love to be back there again. And then I got this wonderful opportunity working at Warner Brothers, testing their streaming service with DC Comics. So, you know, I'm testing Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and all of these iconic superheroes that I grew up with. And now it's passing through my hands and I'm delivering it to hundreds and thousands of people. And I'm like, yeah, this is really cool. Like, I love what I do. And then I had some disconnects with my manager. But then I remembered this agile communication technique which I learned at a conference similar to this one. I used that technique and the conflict completely disappeared and I just went back to loving my job. And that is why I'm here today, is to share these techniques with other QA folks. So now, let's talk a little bit about these workplace statistics. This was like very staggering 
to me to find out when I was researching for this talk that 46% of employees in the U.S. are not satisfied with their work. 70% of employees in the U.S. leave their job not because of the company, but because of the manager. Managers that retain employees are much longer to stay at a company. And so I started to think about what is missing? Why is there such a high turnover rate <laughs> in the workforce? Has anyone here ever left a job because of the manager and not because of the company? Okay. <laughs> So I see four hands go up. So this is something that it impacts us, I would say sooner or later, at some point in our career. So yeah, I'm gonna make you guys do a little bit of work because I know it's at the end of the day and everyone's already had a long day, so I'm gonna make this a little more interactive. So sales and influence. Now this is something I wish I knew more about. So I was in Malaysia working for a mobile music startup and I got like shipped off to Malaysia to do the system integration testing like through our APIs, our partners APIs, hardware integration and we're just trying to figure out if we could launch this product or not. There were so many layers of complexity, and I wish I knew how to communicate all these layers of complexity to the tech leads. You know, I think it would have made my life a little bit easier. So what happened is like I worked 10 days straight, 12 hours a day, trying to figure out if we could even launch this product. I was the only QA engineer. This had never been done before. And then it's like, I had to figure out <laughs> if we could do this or not. Like, is it even feasible? So I just like powered down, worked very hard, figured out how to do it, got the product launch. And then after all of that, I'm like, oh my God, like how did we end up in that place? And then I thought my life would be so much easier if I knew how to articulate all these complexities and all these risks to the tech leads. So I've learned a few things since then. <laughs> so when we talk about sales, what I found very interesting is that there is a lot of neuroscience that goes behind how are products sold. So now let's say you go to an e-commerce site and you're like, okay, I wanna buy some towels. So what you will find is the way that the copy is laid out is they don't focus so much on the features of the products, but they focus more of, on the benefits in the terms of a daily benefit to the user. When you start to frame what you sell in those terms, it's much easier for the user to understand. So for example, I wanna like buy some towels and I'm looking at all these towels and there's like 300 thread count and 400 thread count. Does that resonate with me? I'm like, no, I mean, that's a product feature. But if they say, oh, this towel is so soft, it's gonna make you feel like, you know, like you're a rat, you know, like you're like touching a teddy bear. You're like, oh, wow. But I can relate to that experience because I could relate to that experience on a daily basis. And that is the power of sales, is how do you frame what you're selling? So now how does this apply to us? Because we're all testers, right? <laughs> We're all testing product features, getting stuff out the door. So it's about framing what you do, framing the benefits of testing and framing it in the context of how are you gonna move the business forward versus just focusing on the features of testing. So that's actually a sales technique for you to use in your communication, like 
you know, with your managers, with your colleagues. So another sales technique, because our mind is very geared to build a better version of ourselves. That's pretty much how, like, how our brain works. <laughs> and so a lot of sales is focused around results. So we want to start talking about our testing in that same context. So one way to frame results is to use visualization before and after photos. So another example. Suppose you want to try like a new diet, you know, or some weight loss drug. When you go and like look at it, do you see a before photo and an after photo? You're like, yeah, because it's like, that's who I want to be. So that resonates with me because that is how our brains are wired to see things. So we want to use the same technique and use it in our context. So it could be if you want to introduce a new tool, you want to introduce a new process, you can say this is how it is now, this is the before picture and this is the after picture and you can use some sort of a visualization, some sort of a diagram to frame your results. And this is just another way to get your, your point across. And so usually when we think about sales and influence, I'm thinking, yeah, I don't really think about QA engineers. You know, I think about like sales people and, you know, like car salesmen. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm nothing like that. That's not who I am. And then I started to think, well, who are we as QA engineers? You know, we have certain tendencies or certain things that we like. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I think we're curious. I think we're analytical. I think we're always kind of, you know, like on a mission to improve ourselves. So then I started to think, well, how could I actually like map this out? And so I actually came across this DISC model, which is a map of human behavior. So here we're going from outgoing to reserve, from task oriented to people oriented. And then I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I think we're somewhere here. Because for me, you know, I always have like a pile of tickets I gotta work on. I'm always kind of like heads down and you know, it's like one task after another. And then I started to think about where where are the people that we interact with? So of course, <laughs> here I always think about product owners because they have a tendency to be outgoing and task oriented because they're always about what's the next thing? When are we gonna release? Are there any blockers? That's what they care about. So when I worked at Spotify, with the product owner there, I can just remember this like, it was like every like other day or every three days, because we were launching product features on all different platforms. It's always like, are we ready to release? Like that's the only thing he wanted to know. And I'm like, yeah, working on it, I'm gonna let you know. Or are there any blockers? So what I started to do is, I thought about how, what deliverable can I create to structure my communication to meet his needs. So I actually created a dashboard that showed all of the, leading, all, all of the latest testing statuses on all platforms, so then he could look at that every day and then he knew exactly what was going on. So what we wanna start to see is these are some of the behavioral types associated with each quadrant. So outgoing, task-oriented, dominant, driving, doer. Does anyone else have a product owner like that? Yes, no, maybe, you know, because they're always, <laughs> they're very uh, self-starting and uh, likes, likes to see, you know, likes to get stuff done. So this is where I saw us, or this is where I saw myself speaking for me. And the other quadrants, people-oriented and reserved, 
supporting, steady, and stable. I always think about the customer support leads because they are on the front lines, they're dealing with people, and they're the ones that always have kind of that like consistent response. So what we want to start to see are what are the key insights into these behaviors. So for dominant, for outgoing and task oriented, the key relationship insight is results. So you want to start to create your communications and your structures for communications. It's around results. When is this done? Like for example, I had built him a dashboard. For people oriented and reserved, sincere appreciation. Again, I always think about like the customer support leads that, you know, they're all dealing <laughs> with all our customers calling in and not always being so happy. Why don't you, you know, let them know the difference that they're making? You know, just get like the impact it would have on them. Oh, and one other thing, oh, on this, sometimes we can see ourselves here, but we could have a manager that's in a very different quadrant. So what we want to start to see is where are we in this model and where are the people that we interact with in this model? So the first step in improving our communication is knowing that and then we can start to begin to understand what do they really need and how can I satisfy that? And oh, when I actually kind of took a step back and looked at this whole thing and got that this is where I'm at and that the key relationship insight to me is trust and integrity, it sort of altered like how I saw myself and I actually learned something about myself and I'm like, wow, I didn't see it in that context before. But that's just something like that sort of showed up for me while I was doing this. So, I remember the first time I was called a bottleneck. <laughs> I was, um, you know, working at that music startup, launching those mobile products in Malaysia. And, um, you know, we just had like a sprint planning meeting. You get out of your meeting. I woke up and the, t and the tech lead, he said, QA is a bottleneck. And in my head, I am like, OMG, you're calling me a bottleneck? I literally had 60 tickets assigned to me on the front end, or excuse me, on the back end. I'm doing the front end testing. I just went to Malaysia, launched that application. I'm working on the next product launch, and I'm the bottleneck? Oh my God. <laughs> I was so triggered in that moment. And then, so this is a while later, I'm working at Warner Brothers. You know, I'm launching DC Universe, I'm looking at Batman, Superman, thinking this is great. I was a back-end QA engineer, responsible for doing, you know, back-end testing. I had like a whole bunch of tickets assigned to me. I just had worked that weekend because I was trying to get ready for the release on Monday. And then I had a whole stack of tickets assigned to me and we had to push the release back. And I look up and the developer said, QA is a bottleneck. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe you're calling me a bottleneck. I'm the one who's doing all this work. And in that moment, I was like, oh my God, here we go again. I was so triggered. So now let's talk about brain science and what leads us to be triggered and upset. So our brain is split into two parts. We have our conscious mind and we have our subconscious mind. In our conscious mind, we control our speech, our movement, our behavior. So I can consciously move my hand from here to here. Our subconscious mind houses 
all the experiences and the memories you've had your entire life. Most of your communication is driven by your subconscious mind. Your communication, your pattern behaviors is all driven by your subconscious. Our brain is made up of billions and billions of neurons <laughs> that come together and they create synapses and we have thoughts. It is a very complex organ and yet it, our behavior is also built on predictability. And our brain stores our short-term memories and we have long-term memories. Now we have a part of our brain called the amygdala. That's the location of the amygdala and it's a very primitive part of our brain. It is responsible for our perception of emotions and emotional memories. It actually, all our emotion, our memories are stored there and it's actually the memories that are based on fear and anger. And there's a condition called an, amyg an amygdala hijack is where we experience a threat or fear which puts us into a fight or flight mode, but there is no physical threat there. It's the psychological stress which is present but we get this visceral like experience in our body, like you just feel it, like you just, just wanna like kill someone. So what I came to realize is that what I experience, so based on a trigger, QA is a bottleneck, I had an experience of like being threatened, which is amygdala hijack, and once I could see all that and understand that it's just a function of the brain and that I just got activated based on your stimulus, then I could let that go. So now let's talk about the brain science of communication. This is something interesting that I found uh, on the internet and it's about looking at our energies and how they map to behavioral traits. So now I had talked about most of our communications based on our subconscious mind. We think that things are the way they are and that's just the way it is. So what we want to start to do is move from our subconscious mind into our conscious mind is where we consciously take actions to move the conversation forward. So in here, if you see someone that's leading with fiery red, they're competitive, determined, you know, I think about product owners, you know, because they're always like kind of leading and managing and delegating and that is the energy that they're leading from. When I, when I look at cool blue and who's leading from cool blue, I, I often think of the developers that I'm working with because they're very like analytical, they're logical, they like to think about things before they say it. When I look at who's leading from sunshine yellow, people that are very sociable, they're the life of the party, they're the first people to do karaoke, now at any one time, we have a primary energy that we're leading with, and we also have a secondary energy. So you wanna start to see where are you in this, and you wanna look in the context of your daily life, because that's gonna be your most predominant energy is you know, what you do every day. So we wanna start to become more self-aware. And inside of doing this, we want to start to see other people's energies, but we want to meet people at their energy level, not your energy level. So if I'm dealing with someone who's leading from fiery red, I'm going to ask him, 
well, you know, what, what task should I do? Or I'll have this task ready because that is what they're interested in. If I'm dealing with someone who is sunshine yellow, I'll say, hey, do you want to have coffee? Do you guys want to go out? You know, we'll do an outing. If I'm interacting with someone in cool blue, like, you know, I think of, you know, developers that I've worked with, I would ask him or her, like, hey, you want to do some sort of a logic game or a puzzle? And in that way, I can move the conversation forward with a conscious attempt at meeting them at their energy level. So, the, so these were just, yeah, the steps that I mentioned. We want to understand who we are. Now we're all wired in a certain way. We have natural tendencies to do something, some things well, some things not as well. So it's a science of self-awareness. Like, who are you in this? And we want to start to look at ourselves. We want to start to, <laughs> you know, look at the people we're interacting with. You know, where, where are they in their energy levels? And then we want to take actions to move the conversation forward. So I think we've got to look to the archetype of communication, <laughs> which is Lieutenant Ahura, the communicator on the Starship Enterprise. Now you may remember this one, or you may remember this one. She can communicate on all frequencies and on, and on all channels. Her brand archetype is the explorer whose core desire is freedom, and she explores who she is through exploring the world. So now that we got some tools in our toolbox, we want to communicate on all frequencies and, all, <laughs> and on all channels. And in that way, we can manage any conflict. So managing conflict. So who here has, has had a conflict that they had to deal with in the workplace, either with their manager or with a, or with a colleague? Okay, so I see, see a few hands up, almost like half the room. So this is something we're dealing with, you know? And I think as Q engineers, when we move into more of a modern testing role, we're working with a lot, with, you know, a lot of different teams. These teams may, you know, be co-located. You may be, you know, working with people in different countries and different cultures. So there's sort of like layers and layers of communication that you're, you know, that you're dealing with. So when we talk about managing conflicts, so back when I was at Warner Brothers, I, um, you know, doing the back end QA work, I'm launching, you know, this SVOD service. And then when these communication disconnects started to happen again with my manager, I knew I needed to have a conversation with him. I was very clear on that. And then I remembered this agile communication technique that I learned in a conference similar to this. And the technique is to say, this is what I've observed, this is how it made me feel, and this is what I need. And when we start to say what we need, we actually have a starting place to start from. Because in life, we don't often go around telling people what we need. And I thought, oh my God, in the workplace, I'm gonna tell somebody what I need? Like, can I do that? But I use this technique, I transform the conversation, the disconnects disappeared, and I just went back to loving my job again. So this is the technique here. Instead of saying something like, you're a jerk, is that gonna get you very far? So that's a reaction. So we want to come from a created place where we say what has happened, and then you're saying the impact it has on, on you, and then you're basically making a request by stating what you need. 
So the other part of managing conflict is actually expecting conflict. But we don't really kind of go around day to day thinking, oh, I'm going to expect some conflict. We're like, no, we're just kind of doing what we do. And then if something happens, then you're like, oh, I may deal with this or I may not deal with this. There's a lot of strategies for managing conflict. So who here has had a conflict that you did not want to confront? That you're like, eh, whatever, I'm just not going to do anything. OK, so I see about half, half the hands in the room came up. So that's also part of, that's a strategy for managing conflict is like avoiding, denying, just not going to do anything. Maybe it'll just magically resolve itself. So for the first step is you consciously <laughs> need to know that you have a conflict and that you are willing to deal with that conflict. And now we move from our subconscious brain into our conscious brain because we know I'm going to deal with that. And then now you've got that tool in your toolbox to empower you to deal with that conflict. So this is just some software folklore that I came across. This is just one of my favorite kind of like software testing quotes. Um, what I find fascinating here is looking at the constraints that we have in communication and how does that get reflected into the software product. So I want you to start to look for yourselves like whenever have you had like a missing requirement or some gaps and then how that got reflected into the product. Because as human beings and working with different groups, sometimes we get siloed or whatever the situation is, we want to just start to look at that and just understand the impact of the constraints of communication. So what I want to start to leave you with is that I want you to know that there are many techniques that you can use, communication techniques, to handle any situation. To start to think about your communication styles and who you are in the world of conflicts and the world of moving conversations forward. You know, have a willingness to improve your communication. Because like I said, as QA engineers in a modern testing role, I think we're interacting with more and more people as all our systems become more coupled. And we're interacting more with you know, managers and tech leads and VPs. Under, start to understand how other people communicate and the impact of their communication and how you can take a step to improve that. And I wanna leave you feeling empowered in your communication. So you've got some tools in your toolbox that will help you in, in what you're dealing with. So for me, this is just something I'm very passionate about. I think communication, it is dynamic, it is powerful. We can build bridges, and we can build walls, and we can tear down walls. And our communication, the way we interact with people on a daily basis, it really shapes our experience of how we're experiencing our work life. And now I think, you know, being the voice of quality or a quality champion, you know, sometimes you know, we're the ones who've got to speak up. Sometimes we're the one that's breaking up the party. We're like, no, you can't release. I just found a critical issue and it's like in the 11th hour and you've got to say something because you know this release can't go out. Um, people, everybody wants to be heard. This is just a function of being human and who we are as human beings. And for me, 
you know, effective communication, it can solve any disconnect. You can transform your relationship with your colleague or with your manager or whatever you're dealing with, with your ability to communicate with them. So I'm going to leave you with this is what the, with another quote. I'll be monitoring your frequency. Mm -hmm.